Section 16 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. The Origin of Certain Americanisms. Part 2. Turning from words and phrases which are admitted to good verbal society, there are some curious and ancient pedigrees to be found for others, which do not now pass beyond popular speech, and are in many instances still lower in the scale, never having risen above the level of slang. Tramps, for vagrants, has risen to an established position, and may be said to be accepted in literature. But its lowly origin as convenient slang is still recent and yet i find that it was used by de quincey who says tramps as they are called in solemn acts of parliament so the ancestry of this americanism is not only english but has statutory recognition slouch as a noun and generally in the form he's no slouch to express extreme effectiveness or skill was widely used some years ago in the united states the word is good english in other connections and in the slang form was vigorous and expressive but we cannot claim priority of invention for this phrase for gay in his first pastoral writes thou vaunting slouch i also noticed that michael kelly in his reminiscences published in eighteen twenty five says captain stanley for whom manly years was no slouch at the bottle which shows that phrase was current in england at the time many years older than slouch used as slang was the use of the word notions in popular american speech and especially in new england where it might be seen as a sign over village shops to indicate to passers-by that all sorts of things and particularly articles of dress might be bought within yankee notions was a current and common phrase this like so many other words in america was a case of survival in the new world of usage which had faded out in the old how old it was i do not know but that it was well understood in england in the american sense during the eighteenth century is clear for young in his night thoughts has these lines and other worlds send odors sauce and song and robes and notions framed in foreign looms yankee notions which smacked so strongly of new england in earlier days reminds me of the old pronunciation in that part of the country of shire as sheer within thirty years shire town was generally pronounced sheer town by the country folk of new england this pronunciation or that which makes it sure continues of course universally where shire is a final syllable but when used alone or at the beginning of a word phonetic spelling has triumphed and shire is pronounced as spelled yet the old yankee pronunciation was not only the old english practice but was that of cultivated society in queen anne's day we may read it in the prologue to the satires where pope writes a hireling scribbler or a hireling peer knight of the post corrupt or of the sheer swift on the other hand makes shire as a termination rhyme with hire which would be rather forced even at the present day there is another word now growing old-fashioned i think much used on the coast in fishing and i believe formerly at least widely used in a figurative sense signifying to entice or draw on by degrees this is the verb toll whether it survives in england i do not know but in american speech it still continues as a well understood and descriptive term if it be an americanism it is one of our earliest settlers brought it with them from england where it then mingled in the best society for we find it in use by fletcher and the faithful shepherdess or voices calling me in the dead of night to make me follow and so toll me on through mire and standing pools to find my ruin the fact that mr dice thinks a note necessary to explain the meaning of toll leads me to believe that since the days of fletcher it has become an americanism and has been lost to british speech there is another phrase common in new england if not in the united states generally which has an equally long and even more distinguished pedigree it occurs in inquiries as to distance or in stating distance by asking how far do you call it to the next town 
mrs stopes in her lives of the burbages quotes from macbeth the line how far tis called to forest and argues that as this is a pure scotch idiom it shows that shakespeare must have been in scotland as i have just said the phrase has always been common use in new england which was settled in the seventeenth century by shakespeare's englishmen and to which came at that time very few if any scotch some years ago a southern member of congress used the phrase where are we at which had a success little anticipated i imagine by its author for it was caught up by the newspapers and passed widely into the current speech of the moment i think it gained its attraction not merely because it was expressive but because it was thought odd and ungrammatical however this may be the phrase was not new for lee hunt in his introduction to the dramatists of the restoration writes the dramatic power of wycherley would not have known what to be at with the unseasonable and arbitrary superfluities of dryden the parallel is not exact but the relationship is very close what to be at in the sense of what to do is not far removed from where are we at in the sense of where are we lee hunt i am sorry to say was guilty of something much worse than this despite the fact that he was not only a graceful writer but an accomplished man and both a lover and student of literature he let fall from his pen the entirely odious word brainy it is of course quite true that we have both hearty and handy as slang and nervy but this fact does not seem to make brainy any more tolerable or attractive i fear that this word must now be called an americanism for it may be frequently seen in our newspapers and not even the example of lee hunt can redeem it from its utter hideousness the fact is and it always seems a very strange one that many of our newspaper writers especially our reporters when they sit down to address the public do so in a strange language found only when talking or writing to their wives their children or their friends i commend to their consideration the following passage from macaulay's essay on johnson when he wrote for the publication he did his sentences out of english into johnsonese his letters from the hebrides to mrs thrale are the original work of that which the journey to the hebrides is the translation and it is amusing to compare the two versions when we were taken upstairs he says in one of his letters a dirty fellow bounced out of bed on which one of us was to lie this incident is recorded in the journey as follows out of one of the beds on which we were to repose started up at our entrance a man black as cyclops from the forge sometimes johnson translated aloud the rehearsal he said very unjustly has not wit enough to keep it sweet then after pause it has not vitality enough to preserve it from putrefaction johnson was a great man from whom much wisdom may be learned but here he gives us a vivid example by his own bad habit of what to avoid if all newspaper men would only write as they talk more carefully of course and without slang but in the plain simple excellent words of their daily speech they would render a real service both to their fellow-citizens and to the english language and they would keep clear of such repulsive coinages as brainy and of such abuses of language and meaning as the employment of probe in the sense of an inquiry or investigation this objectionable word brainy however reminds me of another slang term which has lately come into vogue this is dotty signifying the decay of the faculties or debility of mind i was interested to discover in the life of edward fitzgerald that dotty with precisely the same significance as the modern slang was used by the suffolk peasants probably therefore it is a very ancient word although a recent immigrant to the united states there is another word of interest not only in itself but on account of the brutal action which it represented in the first half of the nineteenth century both word and custom were held to be characteristically american and were flung at us as a reproach every reader of bongalti's ballads will remember the very savage one about jabez dollar which attacked us for every conceivable shortcoming but particularly for gouging as a recognized mode of fighting by forcing out an opponent's eyeball with a thumb or finger 
how generally this barbarous and unflatteringly brutal form of attack was diffused among the criminal classes or the wild and rough population of the frontier it is impossible to say there is no doubt that this mode of savage fighting as well as the word which described it was unfortunately well known at that period in the united states but we come by it by descent both word and habit existed in yorkshire mrs gaskell in her life of charlotte bronte when describing haworth writes as few shirked their liquor the occasion was funeral feasts there were very frequently up and down fights before the end of the day sometimes with the horrid additions of pausing apparently a peculiarly painful mode of kicking and gouging and biting from this part of england where is also found the very characteristic american word bottom to describe low-lying lands in the valley came many immigrants to colonial and provincial america bringing their words and customs good or bad with them and gouging was one of the latter so the british satirist with his eyes tight shut toward yorkshire held us up to scorn as particularly guilty of a particularly brutal kind of fighting there seems to be a moral to be drawn from this identification of the origin of a word and custom and that is that it is well to exercise a little charity as well as to know one's ground before accusing one's neighbor of either barbarism or bad english indeed all the pedigrees which i have brought together and which have been gathered casually without research from authors whom every one reads teach us the same lesson there is no particular satisfaction although there is some amusement in pointing out the origin of words and phrases which reveal the absurdity of the british fault-finding that sets them down as americanisms and vulgar distortions of our common speech but there is something far more important than this involved in any study no matter how slight of the varying forms of english words and that is the language itself people ordinarily accept the language to which they are born as they do the air they breathe without any feeling of either responsibility or gratitude thousands of people especially children and college students are set or set themselves to the work of acquiring foreign tongues a most commendable labor and never learn or even seek to learn how to speak properly or write intelligently the noble language which is theirs as a birthright yet is the english language one of our greatest and most precious possessions to be jealously watched and guarded to take only the practical side i have often wondered how many people have stopped to consider that our language is one of the greatest bonds which holds the union together perhaps the strongest as it is the most impalpable of all if it were not for our common speech lincoln's mystic chords would be dumb indeed in the language too lies the best hope of assimilating and americanizing the vast masses of immigrants who every year pour out upon our shores for when these newcomers learn the language they inevitably absorb in greater or less degree the traditions and beliefs the aspirations and the modes of thought the ideals and the attitude toward life which that language alone enshrines these immeasurable gifts have a peculiar significance to us of the new world but in addition are those no less beneficent which all who speak the english share in common to possess english as a birthright opens to every man so born without effort and without price the greatest literature except that of greece which the world has known it makes us kin to both teutonic and the latin languages and the doors to both these great literatures open easily to any of us who enter in a few years ago a german philologist committed the words in some of the principal modern languages and found that english had two hundred and sixty thousand in its vocabulary next longo intervallo came german with eighty thousand words then italian with seventy five thousand french with thirty thousand turkish with twenty two thousand five hundred and spanish with twenty thousand mere size of vocabulary as the french figaro said in commenting upon the figures does not imply literary excellence or the reverse literary deficiency
but the enormous number of english words so much greater apparently than that of any other modern tongue shows beyond question the assimilative expansive quality of the language as well as its richness and flexibility it proves that the language has grown and spread with the growth and spread of the people who speak it keeping pace with the exploration of all comers of the globe and with the multiplication of industries and the widening of knowledge in the number of people who speak it and in its distribution throughout the world it comes to-day nearer to being a world language than any other now spoken such language with its history and traditions with its literature and its unequalled richness is a great heritage and the duty devolves upon all to whom it belongs as a birthright to guard and cherish it to preserve its purity and strength and in order that it may retain its commanding place not to encourage and cultivate differences but to strive to secure the greatest possible uniformity in its use in all the quarters of the globe the importance of uniformity in usage not only the quality but to the growth and spread of the language can hardly be overestimated uniformity in pronunciation cannot be hoped for because variations in pronunciation will range from the strange dialects of remote and isolated communities to those fine shades of difference which exist even among the best educated people who are in contact with the world of men and books and which are of little practical importance men may be capable of keeping their minds unchanged when they change their sky but not the manner in which they sound their vowels and consonants the fact that a hundred miles is enough sometimes to cause a difference in the manner in which people speaking precisely the same language sound the letter a for instance is sufficient to show how inept it is to talk about phonetic spelling but although uniform pronunciation desirable no doubt but not essential may be unattainable substantial uniformity in meaning and spelling is not only attainable but practically attained no matter where a book or newspaper may be written or printed every one in the english-speaking world can read it this is the uniformity which should be seditiously maintained for confusion of multiplication of forms either of meaning or spelling would be disastrous to the language uniformity of meaning can be trusted in the long run to take care of itself either by the process of adopting new meanings or abandoning old but spelling excites a constant desire among many persons to effect instantaneous reforms and improvements for both reforms and improvements seem so delightfully obvious and so easy to accomplish no one will deny that there are many english words in which spelling might be advantageously simplified and the natural movement of the language has been in this direction but the attempt to effect such changes suddenly and arbitrarily seems to be as undesirable as it is difficult i read not long ago since defoe's complete gentleman which has been printed for the first time from the original manuscript in the british museum spelling reformers can find in its pages authority for many simplified spellings which would no doubt delight their hearts but we can also find on many pages the same word spelled in different ways the multiplication of silent and double letters and we perceive in short that confusion reigns supreme this book was written only a few years before johnson brought out his dictionary and thereby rendered the inestimable service of erecting a standard thus producing a uniformity in spelling which never existed before since johnson's time the whole movement of the language has been towards simplification and silent letters have been not only silently but steadily disappearing there are those who think that this is best to allow the language to work out its own destiny in its own way in accordance with its genius and spirit it is possible that if mr archer's plan of a meeting of representative scholars and writers from all parts of the english-speaking world who should agree on certain changes in spelling were carried out spelling might be simplified at one blow and at the same time uniformity be preserved but it is absolutely certain that no self-constituted committee no association here or there no executive order no body of men representing only themselves or groups of individuals in one or even two countries can force a sudden reform in spelling such attempts only add confusion 
and it is infinitely better to express an idea by a clumsy symbol which everybody uses than to try to inject a far more accurate symbol which only a small minority will employ as things are it is much better to permit the language to work out its own modifications as it does its extensions in its own way the cardinal object of all who love the english language should be to maintain its strength and purity and the greatest enemies to strength and purity are the abuse which warps and distorts the meaning of words and the confusion which results from efforts to reform either meanings or spellings to suit the taste and fancy of individuals let us be content with our great possession which has come down to us for the centuries meeting victoriously every chance and adventure and never failing those who have called upon it whether for the simple needs of daily life or to express in the noblest verse the thoughts and visions of the great poets end of section sixteen Section 17 of the Democracy of the Constitution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Fascio. The Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge. Diversions of a Convalescent. Part 1. To one who, since boyhood and scarlet fever, had never known what it was to be kept for a day in bed by illness. The swift change from health and activity to the condition of a surgical case, helpless, inert, imprisoned, was startling in the extreme. A wild dream, it seemed to be, at the first return to consciousness. The reawakening came as if it were a rebirth, which, like its original, was only a sleep and a forgetting. Then one became suddenly aware that the world had shrunk into a small room, and that this new little world was filled with one's own petty personality and with naught else. All the interests of yesterday, all the thoughts of the waking hours, of public affairs, of private joys and personal cares, all alike seemed to have vanished. But their departure caused no sorrow. The vacant spaces, the empty air which they left behind, brought only a drowsy sense of rest and quiet. There was no longing to fill the void so suddenly created, even the mere thought of attempting it was so wearying, so painful indeed, that it faded away with the visions of what once had been, leaving nothing but a sensation of peace and soft content. For the first days, lying chained in one position, it was enough to gaze through the window, to see the grassy slope climbing slowly among the grey ledges to the crest of the cliffs, and then beyond that crest to behold the ocean floor and the far horizon line. There was a peculiar joy in watching the darkness fade, as the vault of heaven filled with gradual light, while over all stole quietly the flush of dawn. Then the shadows appeared and shortened and disappeared, came again as the sun passed the zenith, and slowly lengthened until swallowed up in the gathering night. And against the darkening sky, where the gazer all motionless had seen the dawn, there now sprang out the flashing light from the high tower on the low ledge hard by which marked the entrance to the city's harbor while still beyond, far down on the horizon's edge, glittered another great light, which from its sunken reef pointed out for those who had gone down to the sea in ships the way to safety and repose. A few days passed, and then came another room, another window, and another view. Here the ocean seemed to lie at one's feet, no distant horizon line, but the coast on the other side of the broad bay, curving away in a line as beautiful as the Apulian shore, when we look at it from the Taormina. The infinite aspect of the sea, which, seen from the first window, knew no barriers until it washed the shores of Portugal, was gone. In its stead, in the place of the brooding peace of the unbounded ocean, came the life and motion of the waters chafing against the land. The great torches which beckoned to the huge ships, suddenly coming up out of the ocean wastes, no longer shot sharply through the darkness, and their place was taken by a quiet little light, burning with red steadfastness only to guide a few stray fishermen or small trading schooners as they made their way north and south, clinging to the coast, which is normally their safety, and at times, alas, their grave. The quiet red light had a calm, domestic air, 
which seemed very soothing and comforting after the piercing flashes of the stern towers rising in lonely abruptness from the sea. October of last year, if not a close-bosom friend of the maturing sun, so far as any one could see, was certainly a season of mists. For five days the New England coast was wrapped in a fog of unequal duration and density. Yet to one with naught to do but watch, it was soon made manifest that these sea mists were not guilty of the blank absence of change so dreary to the impatient passengers on fog-bound ships. Without apparent reason the mists would retreat, and the rocky coast emerge as if suddenly reborn into the world. Then the mist columns would come marching back with gathered reinforcements from the ocean, and all things on land and sea would vanish behind the soft gray veil. Sometimes they would creep in over the surface of the water, and all on the sea level would disappear, leading the lighthouse up aloft, vivid and distinct, looking down upon the eddying wreaths below. And then again they would drift back high up, and the light above would be lost while all the edges of the rocks would be clear upon the water line. All these movements, sudden, surprisingly destitute of reason or apparent cause, were graceful and beautiful, concealing an invisible force which is so impressive to the finite sense, and all the more so here from the extreme gentleness with which it moved. Two fogs succeeded storms, and with the storms came a heavy surf. The slow, gliding movements of the mist were gone, and the whole scene was pervaded with a restless violence. By the hour together the onlooker could watch the waves climbing the reefs and cliffs along the outstretched line of rock-bound coast, only to fall back and come roaring in again, masses of white and angry foam, impelled by hidden forces, exuberant in all the infinite variety which can never grow stale to those who gaze with wonder. Across the clouds and rain swept the great gulls who come from Labrador to pass the winter in the milder climate of Massachusetts. To see them soaring up and down, floating easily upon the gale, careless of rain and wind alike, is a beautiful sight, a spectacle of grace and power which never wearies. As one watches the wonder grows, and ever more insistently the watcher asks how many eons of time nature consumed in the evolution of such perfect flying machines. Nearer home were six crows who had been living on the point for some weeks. They moved about, consulted together, went from tree to ground and back again, and presented always that exhibition of busy idleness which has such an enduring charm to those whose lot it is to labor in this workaday world. But it was at night that the second window had its most enthralling charm. In the darkness the broad waters of the bay stood out with a still deeper blackness, cold, unrelenting, unwavering. It seemed so unfeeling, so final, that one shrank from it as if it symbolized the last great blank when all material things have perished. Then one raised his eyes, and far across the bay, white and luminous above the blackness of the sea, shone out the electric lights along the shore. They seemed very human, very kind and friendly, those lights across the bay, and on the rare nights when the sky was clear it needed but another lift of the eyes, and one saw the stars in all their steady splendor while toward morning the waning moon would cast its pale light through the air, and the darkness of the waters would soften, and take on the purple tone of Homer's wine-dark sea. Yet the pleasantest memory of that scene of night is, after all, those lights across the bay, which seemed to bring hope and rest and peace when the dark water had been passed, and the tired sight lost all weariness as it met the glow of the human lamps, and, far above, the unchanging glitter of the stars. All these sights, thus seen from two windows, had been part of his existence from the day when the convalescent first opened his eyes upon the world about him. The sky and sea, in all their moods, had been the friends of a lifetime. Every ledge, every reef, every pool teeming with life, every bend and curve in the coastline were known to him with a more minute knowledge than anything else on earth. Yet now, as the mind began at intervals to pass outside the mere physical conditions of the body, it would rest with a sensation of deep repose upon those familiar sights, and find in them beauties and reflections, not without depth of meaning, never noted in all the years which had gone before. They all seemed full of voices, 
and the voices were saying, Look at us. You thought you knew us well. But we are filled with undiscovered beauties, and we have many secrets yet untold. At the same time the mind, as it reawakened, recoiled as at the outset from all which had occupied it in the daily round of life now so remote. The thoughts would not take their wonted course. The effort to make them do so was not only forbidden, but was too laborious to be attempted. So the thoughts, thus set free, turned first without strain, entirely of themselves, quite restfully to the familiar sights of ocean and land and sky which came unaided to the field of vision. It seemed like a voyage of discovery, with ever new delights, as the eye unmoving read the twice-told tale. It was beyond measure interesting to cease from all effort to apply one's mind, and to allow the vagrant thoughts to stray whithersoever they would in glorious irresponsibility. Very soon indeed they began to extend their journeys, and to travel from the visible world into the world of books. Not that book world which is filled with unconcerning facts and crowded with the gathered knowledge of the centuries, but that far fairer world which is the creation of imagination. The convalescent restored to health and strength remembers well the first thought, which was not a part of what he saw, and which floated into his head on one of the first mornings as he watched the dawn. It brought with it the memory of certain lines in Matthew Arnold's well-known poem, The Wish. Bathed in the sacred dews of morn, the wide aerial landscape spread. The world which was ere I was born, the world which lasts when I am dead which never was the friend of one, nor promised love it could not give, but lit for all its generous sun, and lived itself, and made us live. The lines are as familiar as they are beautiful. They come from a melancholy poem. But at that moment there seemed in them no shade of sadness, only sympathetic feeling, a consoling and tender loveliness. It also happened that during the summer just past, the convalescent had read the Odyssey. Now his mind went back to it, and all the stories came drifting by, each one bringing a picture which seemed to frame itself in the window and find its scene upon the cliffs with their ocean background. Chief among them, most constantly visited, was the return of Odysseus in disguise and the slaying of the suitors in the hall, perhaps the greatest story, merely as a story, ever written. In some unexplained way the incident of Argos seemed to stand out especially among all the others, and the convalescent found himself with his well-nigh all-forgotten Greek, trying feebly, and yet without a sense of effort to put the lines together. They are few indeed, no great feat to say them over, if one can but recall them, which the searcher could not do except in fragments. There lay the dog Argos, full of vermin. Yet even now, when he was aware of Ulysses standing by, he wagged his tail and dropped both his ears, but nearer to his master he had not now strength to draw. And then... But upon Argos came the fate of Black Death. That is all. The recognition of the master when all others fail, and then the death of the old dog. There is deep pathos in it, in the contrast between the loving instinct of the animal and the human forgetfulness of the absent. I am as true as truth's simplicity, and simpler than the infancy of truth. We must turn to another great genius to find the phrase which exactly describes the imagination from which came forth the tale of the Odyssey. It so happened that a few weeks later the reviving convalescent read a book which contained a burlesque of Homer. The last sentence of this bit of humor may also have been intended to be comic, or perhaps was written in the profoundest irony, but it seemed as if it was seriously meant. The author wished universities to understand what the classics really were, quote, only primitive literature, in the same class as primitive machinery, and primitive music, and primitive medicine, unquote. The convalescent wondered as he read this observation what the author meant by primitive, for Homer's men were much farther removed from primitive man in the scientific sense than we are from the men of the Iliad. The statement, however, although occurring at the end of a burlesque of Homer, referred to the classics generally. So the convalescent diverted himself by wondering whether the writer regarded the authors of the Republic, the Politics, and the De Natura Rerum as 
primitive men. The distinction between intellectual power and mere knowledge of accumulated facts seemed in some way to have been lost sight of, and the convalescent tried to think of the men in our own radiant civilization, who in mere naked power of thought and intellect surpassed Plato and Aristotle and Lucretius. Their names did not at the moment occur to him, probably on account of his weakened condition. Most of all, the convalescent marveled at the queer theory that primitive men should not be able to produce works of the imagination, because they were destitute of modern machinery. He had always thought that among so-called primitive people, in the dawn of civilization, the imagination was unusually strong, just as it is in a child compared with the grown man. This he had believed to be a truism, and indeed he well knew that it was one of the commonplaces glorified by Macaulay, to borrow Carlyle's phrase. Did not a genius greater even than Homer, he said to himself, touched the last scene of a royal tragedy with the bitter memory of a loved and faithless horse? Who can forget the effect produced by the thought of Roan Barbary upon the fallen and imprisoned king with sudden death lurking behind the arras? The conversation with the groom is simple, commonplace almost, in expression, and yet it conveys a sense of pathos, and misery so poignant that it pierces the heart. Then, as the convalescent reflected still further upon the dog Argos, there came to him the memory of a great actor moving crowded audiences to smiles and tears by saying in a quiet voice, quote, If my dog Schneider were here, he would know me, unquote. just as the rhapsodists moved the Greeks by repeating in noble verse the twice told tale of Odysseus and his old hound. It seemed as if we too must be primitive or else that the poet who sang of Achilles's wrath touched a chord which always vibrates, and had in all he wrote the quality of the eternal so long as human nature exists. Perhaps, after all, he was neither primitive nor modern, but simply a great genius. From Homer, the convalescent's mind wandered happily, and of its own accord to the poetry of his own language. He found himself trying to repeat verses which, without any will of his own, came fluttering into his mind. He was struck by the fact that those which came first were not from the poets of the nineteenth century, among whom are numbered some of the best loved and most familiar, but were from the Elizabethans, from the seventeenth century poets, from the song-writers of the great period of English song, from the bard sublime, whose distant footsteps echo through the corridors of time. One of the very first, why he could not tell, was Ben Jonson's very familiar stanza. Quote, it is not growing like a tree, in bulk doth make man better be, or standing long an oak three hundred year, to fall a log at last, dry, bald, and sere. A lily of a day is fairer far in May, although it fall and die that night. It was the plant and flower of light. In small proportions we just beauties see, and in short measures life may perfect be. Unquote. It is but one stanza on a poem of many stanzas not otherwise memorable. But as the convalescent repeated to himself the well-known lines, known by heart for so many years, suddenly he seemed to see, as he had seen in the familiar landscape spread before his eyes, a new beauty and deeper meaning which he had never noticed before. In the lines he discovered, as he thought, a brief epitome of the Elizabethan genius. In the first and last verses were the aphorisms full of wisdom and reflection, condensed, concise, in which the Elizabethan so delighted, and then in the middle flashed out the tender and exquisite image of the lily, all compact of imaginative beauty. With unerring voice the poet touches that high note which they all in that day seemed able to do whenever they really tried even in the midst of their extravagances and conceits, and all the other faults and failings which were the ephemeral children of the fashion of the day. Scores of critics and lovers of poetry probably had observed all this before in these same verses, but it came to the convalescent as a discovery, and he felt as much happiness as the, quote, watcher of the skies, unquote. Quote, when a new planet swims into his ken, unquote. This stanza of Ben Jonson happened to stray into his mind first. Why, he could not guess. 
but his thoughts ranging at will through the wide spaces of memory turned naturally and chiefly to Milton and Shakespeare, above all to the latter. Passages from Paradise Lost, from Lycidas, Legro, Il Penseroso, the Samson Agonistas, and the Comus, and the lines from the sonnets, came unbidden in the silence of such time. They were only fragments, but there was an endless pleasure in trying to recite them, to see how far the convalescent could go, and there was something infinitely soothing and satisfying in their noble beauty, and in the mere perfection of the words and rhythm. For Milton is the greatest master of metrics in English, and makes an appeal, possibly only to the, quote, chief of organic numbers, old scholar of the spheres, thy music never slumbers, but rolls about our ears, for ever and for ever, unquote. Yet it was to Shakespeare, best known and best beloved, that the convalescent's mind turned most constantly. His words recurred unceasingly as the thoughts, effortless and unfettered, flitted here and there. Passages from the plays, entire sonnets, repeated themselves to the convalescent, some over and over again, always with a sense of peace and deep content. Familiar again is the sight of sea and rock and sky outside the window. They seemed now to be filled with beauties never seen, and music never heard before. Kind hands had placed beside the bed the golden treasury and the Oxford book of English verse, and one day not long after the swift reduction to immobility had befallen the convalescent, he stretched out his hand, took up the golden treasury, opened it at random, and read one Shakespeare sonnet. The physical act of reading those fourteen lines seemed a most remarkable and fatiguing feat at the moment, but once accomplished it filled some hours with pleasure as the convalescent gazed through the yet another window at a sunset fire kindling the clouds, and quietly reflected on what he had just read. The ability to read, after this first memorable experiment, came back more rapidly than any other, and in a little while it was possible to read many lines, instead of only fourteen. End of section 17section 18 of the democracy of the constitution this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michael fascio the democracy of the constitution and other addresses and essays by henry cabot lodge diversions of a convalescent part 2 in the oxford book of verse shakespeare's songs are printed together the convalescent knew them all very intimately, but it so happened that he had never read them one after another in unbroken succession, and the effect of doing so was a fresh impression of the limitless quality of Shakespeare's genius. To write a song of the most perfect beauty, when he happened to think that it would be well at that point to give Jack Wilson a chance to sing something, seems to have been as easy to him as it is to the lark to trill all day. So easy to him and yet how rare and marvellous the art. Swinburne says in his drastic way that English songwriting, in the fine and true sense, ended with Herrick. It sounds like an extreme statement, and yet it is difficult to controvert it. Poems, lyrics of highest beauty and splendour, touching every note in the gamut of emotions, we have had since then, and in a rich abundance. But the lyrics, or the poems of the first rank, which are also songs which sing themselves and lose no jot of their perfection, are sufficiently uncommon since the early seventeenth century, when it seemed as if every poet and dramatist had the power, either at some great moment, or, like the master of them all at any moment, to sing when the fancy caught him. As the convalescent read and read again the Shakespearean songs one after another, he found himself wondering how any being of ordinary intelligence could think that the same hand wrote, quote, The world's a bubble, and the life of man less than a span, unquote. and then, quote, Hark, hark, the lark at heaven's gate sings. Unquote. Or if there be a faint doubt about the world, described as quote, Lord Virulam's elegant parody of a Greek epigram. It is conceivable that the man who wrote, quote, That time of year thou mayst in me behold, 
when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang unquote. who gave us one of matthew arnold's great touchstones of poetry quote, absent thee from felicity a while could also have been guilty of such lines as quote, o sing a new song to our god above avoid profane ones tis for holy choir unquote. which are far below addison's quote, spacious firmament on high unquote. and by no means up to the level of dr watts internal evidence is notoriously untrustworthy yet it is beyond belief that the same man could have written all these three poems or sets of verses one can only repeat in despair the saying of henry labouchere Quote, I am perfectly willing to admit that Bacon wrote Shakespeare's plays, if they would only tell me who wrote the works of Bacon. Unquote. But as the reader closed the book, he reflected that after all it was less surprising that Shakespeare should have written all these songs, scattered with prodigal of hand, here and there throughout the plays, than the fact that all the dramatists of that day could each and all apparently write a quite perfect song of great lyrical beauty at least once if they set themselves to do it the convalescent ran over to himself the few he could easily call to mind there was webster of whom nothing is known but who wrote two beautiful tragedies which are still read and which are touches worthy of the master his dark and sinister genius as we see it displayed in the duchess of malfi and vittoria corombona seems as unfitted as possible for lyric poetry and yet when the mood was on him he wrote the famous song sad as one might expect from him but full of tender feeling which is called a land dirge and which begins quote, call for the robin redbreast and the wren unquote. then the convalescent thought of haywood a second-rate man his plays read only by students of the elizabethan literature and yet haywood could write quote, pack clouds away and welcome day with night we banish sorrow unquote. a song worthy of a place in the shakespearean group the next that came to mind was shirley latest of the elizabethan and jacobin dramatists his plays are not now read at all it may be doubted if even the name of any one of them is remembered except by students of literature yet every one knows the lines which are a familiar quotation quote, only the actions of the just smell sweet and blossom in their dust unquote. and these are by no means the best lines in a noble poem in the quiet room the convalescent recalled gradually the whole of the lyric take as an example of its quality the opening lines of the last stanza quote, the garlands wither on your brow then boast no more your mighty deeds upon death's purple altar now see where the victor victim bleeds unquote. There is the splendor of the great epoch in these lines, and here we find it in this weak and forgotten playwright, the last of the great succession. Then well beyond the end of the mighty line, memory declared that we could find an example of the great tradition still lingering in a man whose name is well known on account of a dim connection with Shakespeare, whose plays are all unread, who flourished in the years of decadence, Sir William Devenant and yet even he could write a song worthy of the spacious days quote, the lark now leaves his watery nest and climbing shakes his dewy wings he takes this window for the east and to implore your light he sings awake awake the morn will never rise till she can dress her beauty at your eyes Unquote. how the lions sing themselves there rings in them the echo of the glorious days of the days when the audiences at the theatre or the globe heard the boy sing to mariana in the moated grange quote, take oh take those lips away that so sweetly were forsworn and those eyes the break of day lights that do mislead the morn but my kisses bring again bring again seals of love but sealed in vain sealed in vain unquote the convalescent of course could not solve the problem yet it was very pleasant to lie in the stillness and watch the gray mists 
and wonder how these poets and dramatists managed to write such songs in those days long past, and why the art seemed to have been lost, and get no answer to the questioning, but the sound of the musical lines softly chiming as they ran along the chords of memory. From the early poets one went easily on, when once started, to the much-loved poets of later days, beginning with the immortal group at the beginning of the nineteenth century. The songs of Shakespeare led naturally to the plays, not at first to the great tragedies, but to the comedies, where one is borne away into another world which never existed anywhere, and yet exists always and everywhere, a world filled with romance, with light and life and humor, broken here and there by deep notes of tragedy, full of beautiful poetry, and peopled with characters which can never grow old, because they are as eternal as humanity, with no touch of the fleeting fashion of a day about them. The convalescent had loved them long and truly, but it seemed to him that he had never known them so well before, never realized so fully what delightful companions they were, so much more real than any historical figures of men and women who had actually lived and wrought out their lives upon the earth to which long since they had returned. The physical ability to read indefinitely, by the hour together, came back rapidly, and with it the power of reading new books appeared. They could not take the place of those which had come first, of the poetry and imaginings among which memory and thought had so happily roamed and wandered. But these new books began to share the hours with the old. There was no poetry among them. The convalescent had expected no novels, for, although the new novels are countless, they suggest generally only Roger's rule, quote, when I hear of a new book, I take down an old one, unquote. Of course the endless swarms, which, like flights of brown-tailed moths upon a wall, flutter down in their myriads upon the bookstalls clad in gay paper covers, the chief incitement to their sale, were out of the question. Even in robust strength the mind turns from them as it does instinctively from those of the hundred thousand copies sold, which are usually as quickly and irretrievably forgotten within the next year as Pomfret's choice, which sold its innumerable editions in the eighteenth century. Still more emphatically did the mind, sensitive and longing for a happy content, turn from the morbid, the sordid, and above all from the solemnly moral novels with a purpose to which just now a passing notoriety is so readily accorded. Nevertheless, from this unpromising field, unpromising perhaps owing to the reader's distaste for it, there came quite unexpectedly some stories by one author which not only amused, but which brought with them the sense of new characters, created characters, with whom it was a pleasure to live for the brief hour while one read their adventures. When Byron, in the midst of the pleasant fooling and jesting of love's labors lost, says, quote, To move wild laughter in the throat of death, it cannot be, it is impossible. Mirth cannot move a soul in agony, unquote. We suddenly hear the deep tragic note which was one day to become familiar to the world in Lear and Othello. But the task imposed by Rosalind does not go quite so far as Byron's interpretation would make it. She tells him that it must be his part, quote, to enforce the pained impotent to smile. Unquote. It is a difficult feat, but it is not impossible, and the words of this, the earliest, probably of Shakespeare's charming women, came freshly to his mind when the convalescent found himself laughing out loud as he read, quite alone, George Birmingham's story of Spanish gold. Merely as a story, it has the romantic charm. The search for buried treasure always has an unfailing fascination and the scene of the book is laid most fittingly in a remote, unfrequented island among a people isolated from the world, not yet drilled into uniformity by civilization, and at once picturesque, humorous, and pathetic. Upon this stage the characters appear, all are real people, all in their degree entertaining and interesting, but there is one who stands out as the hero, who is a genuine creation, so natural, so delightful, that we welcome him to that goodly company of friends whom we owe to human imagination, from whom we cannot be parted, and who are more really living than those who have actually walked the patient earth. John Joseph Meldon is a being very much alive. To one very grateful reader, under adverse circumstances, he came as a joy, bringing laughter with him and leaving a strong feeling of personal affection behind him. 
He is again the hero in the Major's niece, where he has all the fascination which he possesses in Spanish gold, although the former story has not the romantic attraction of the adventures in search of treasure to be found in the tale born of the Armada tradition. Dr. O'Grady, in General John Regan and Dr. Witty, in the book that bears his name, are variants of the Meldon type, but neither is quite equal to the original, although both are delightful persons. In the red hand of Ulster, beneath the easy humor and the kindly satire, runs a deeper purpose. In the picture of the resolved Ulstermen with their great fighting traditions, of their inability to resist the forces of empire if really employed against them, and of the vacillations of the ministry, and their unwillingness to employ their equally reluctant army and navy, the truth of the Ulster situation seems to be very sharply depicted. But the predominant feeling in the mind of one solitary reader was that of gratitude to Canon Hanne for bestowing upon him the acquaintance, the friendship, and the conversation of J. J. Meldon. In one respect it is sad to confess this attractive person proved a traitor, for the tales of his exploits opened the door to other new books which were welcomed by the regained power to read without limit and the stories of real men who had lived and toiled and vanished came in to share the hours which the poets and the dramatists had for many days monopolized. Instead of playing unfettered in the fields of memory and imagination, the thoughts came back to the world of facts and knowledge. The dream light in which the convalescent had been living so contentedly gave way to the daylight. The cares which infest the day, and the habitual interests and pursuits began to show themselves, and with insistent voices demanded a surcease of the neglect from which they had suffered, and a renewal of the attention which they were wont to command. They would not be denied, these old occupations and duties, and although there were still many tracts of time which went to books, new and old, to meditation on things which were of no practical use, and therefore peculiarly delightful, they asserted their mastery more and more, until at last it was complete. After this there were no more roamings without plan or purpose in pleasant realms of memory and fancy, and the diversions of the convalescent, which had made him happy during so many motionless hours, came to an end. End of Section 18 End of the Democracy of the Constitution and Other Addresses and Essays by Henry Cabot Lodge.